brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, this is working. Hello, um, I'm Selena. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be invited today to talk about music streaming. Um, I'm going to take you through um, the music business in general and, and the changes that have happened largely because of technology and music streaming, which has really disrupted the music business for the past 10 to 15 years. And then we'll go into um, the importance of music streaming and how that factors in both on the consumer side, but also how artists work with streaming companies and how we work with artists and how important it is um, in general to the overall business. So for the past 15 years, um, the music business has been in decline. And when I say the music business, I'm talking about the recorded side of the music business. Um, it's been on a downward trend in terms of revenues since 1999. And that's completely because of technology and peer-to-peer -peer technology. Um, for the first time in 2015, we saw this reverse, and that's completely and solely down to music streaming. There was a 5.9% growth um, in revenues for the recorded music business, driven completely by audio streaming. So we saw a huge decline in physical sales, that CDs, um, down digital downloads as well, and a huge rise in audio streaming. At the moment, there are two modes of consumer behavior that still exist side by side. There's the concept of owning something, which is paying um, a fee for a CD. You, you buy a CD and you have it as a physical product, or you buy a digital download, and that's, the, that's one mode of behavior. And then on the other side, you have the, mo the habit of the sub subscription model. So like Netflix, you pay a fee to access a huge amount of content. And those are the two modes of consumer behavior, behavior that still exist. However, the first one is very much in rapid decline, and the second one, which is a subscription-based model across the entertainment business, and especially in music, is now the dominant way of how people listen to music. So you can see just some stats here. Um, you know, a 60.4% growth in streaming and subscriptions, a decline in physical revenue, so people buying CDs, that's going down. It's going to continue to go down. Um, and a small rise in synchronization rights. So that's, that means when music is used on adverts, um, and that that's called a, a sync. And you can see this graph, which it really is just a complete upward trajectory of how um, streaming has grown year on year. So just a little bit about Deezer. Deezer is the third biggest global music streaming company in the world. We're number one in France and Colombia and very strong across Latin America. Um, we're available in 180 countries, so we have the biggest global footprint of any music streaming service. And we have 14 million monthly active users. Um, one of the things about streaming is we have, at the moment, there's, a, there's 100 million people in the world paying for a subscription to music. And that's only going to set to increase. The way people access, the reason why streaming is gaining traction is because at the touch of a button, people can access a huge amount of catalog for a fee. Um, and this is really opening up opportunities for artists and different types of repertoire to, uh, to, to gain traction with a global audience. So one of the, the features that we have at Deezer is also a feature called Flow, which you see here at the top. And one of the things that we do at Deezer is a combination of both human creation and also the technology side and algorithms. Flow is a button that you push. At a touch of a button, it will analyze your behavior and recommend songs for you to listen to. 
And people use this in different ways. Some people like to choose what they listen to. They search for an album, they search for an artist, they might go to a playlist. But a lot of people also enjoy what we call a lean back experience. So that's having this on and getting recommendations. So there are lots of different modes of behavior that we see at Deezer and we have an incredible amount of data that we look at and we analyze. And there are very much different types of behavior across the, across the world and different demographics in terms of how people choose to listen to music. Just to give you an idea of my role, so I am the intersection between Deezer and all our artists and content creators. That means we are looking at how we present an artist's music and promote and how that looks like and what goes into playlists and working directly with artists and labels to launch artist marketing campaigns and also to develop them because streaming companies now very much can break an artist. On any given day, I get roughly 100 emails an hour. After I step off the stage, I'll have 100 to 200 new emails in my inbox that have landed in. Um, we get 20,000 new songs a day. 20,000. That's not reissues, that's new songs a day. So 20,000 songs a day to get through, uh, my team and the editors, a tiny fraction of that make it to a playlist. An even smaller fraction of that make it to an artist marketing campaign. So how do you stand out when you have 52 million songs at your disposal? How do you gain a fan base as a new and developing artist in the streaming world? So one of the things that we've launched at Deezer is a program called Deezer Next. We launched that last year, and this is our focus for new and developing artists. One of the things that we take very seriously is that we have millions of users, we have an audience of millions, who like and want to discover new music, and we can help introduce new artists to them all over the world. So, Deezer Next, we see four global artists chosen as global priorities. Last year, we had Rag and Bone Man, and then each country, I've sh I'm showing you the German list, um, then pick artists locally to develop in their countries. So, for example, um, Rag and Bone Man and Marie Maggie Rogers were global priorities, so every country playlists and works with them. Um, and for Germany, we've got Bowser, Jack Isaac, Mike Singer, Welshley Arms, Singrid, Vincent Weiss, Lottie, Lily Among the Clouds, and Cero last year. And we're about to, we're launching into, the, into this year's uh, These Are Next Artists. So what's the point? Why, why does it matter if streaming artists work directly with new and developing artists? Well, it's actually really important because you have to develop new talent. Compared to other parts of the business, uh, other parts of the industry, m the music business actually spends a lot more money on artist development, which is essentially like R&D. If we compare it to other industries, we can compare it to software, you compare it to automotive industry, pharmaceutical companies, they all, ha they all have R&D research budgets. Music far outstrips the amount of money that's needed to develop an artist and to break an artist. It's one of the, the biggest issues that the music business faces. It's, it's really spotting new talent, developing them, and getting them to break across the world. So the two global priorities that we've announced this year, and we announce them every quarter, Georgia Smith, was announced in January as our Deezer Next artist, and Zach Abel in March. So we work with them for 12 months. We're in it for the long haul, so it's not just a month, it's not two months, it's three months, it's 12 months of committed playlisting and marketing support because that's really the mi minimum that's needed to help an artist really develop. And you can see here, you know, we really highlight them in the app, you know, 
usually you'll see superstars like Drake and Taylor Swift, but for us it's very important to champion these new and developing artists. You can see that, I mean, Rag and Bowman had an amazing year, but when we started working with him, he was a new artist. Um, but we, you know, we worked with him very closely, and it was very satisfying to see him grow. Last year, International Breakthrough Artist of the Year. So not only the number one Dezenect artist, but also one of the top streaming artists across the board, um, topping the charts in the UK, France, and Germany. We also put Rag and Bowman's music in our TV commercial as a sync, because that is a very important platform to also break an artist. You can see on the left, I wanted to include this here because I think it's interesting. One of the things about music streaming is that UK and US repertoire has always largely dominated the international music space, so a lot of English-speaking artists. We don't see this in streaming. So one of the, th the things that have changed is because of streaming and having a global audience and being able to access lots of different types of music, people are willing to experiment and listen to different types of music. And it doesn't have to be English language. If you have a look at our chart, a lot of, 40% of this is non-English speaking language. So, Rag and Bowman, number one, English. Anne-Marie, English. Ashkid, French, French hip hop. Parcels. Um, sings in English. Day and, Lava, Day and Lara is Brazilian, so Portuguese. Fed, Germ uh, from Colombia. Mike Singer, Tom Misch, Welshly Arms, and Bowser, which is German hip hop as well. So streaming really has opened up the gates to non-English speaking artists. Thank you. So, that's it. <laughs> I thought I wanted to open it up to questions a bit faster rather than talking at you. I think it's much more interesting to take questions and talk about some of the things that I've touched on. You might be interested in certain aspects, so I wanted to get to the question part quicker. So I hope you have some questions. Yes. Hi, hello. Hi. So um, you, you explained very well that the, 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 the trend is to grow mm -hmm. you know, every year, 50, 60%. Yeah. Can you give us some insight about the profitability aspects of this business model? Yes. So um, as I said, 100 million people right now across the world are paying for a music subscription. Um, major labels are making, we're paying out, streaming companies are paying out to labels billions of dollars of revenue. So 1.4 billion, I think the last stats were for Merlin, which is the independent. Sony had 1.6, um, Universal had 1.4. So it's, we're talking in the billions of revenue that's paid out from all streaming companies back to the rights holders. So that, you know, in terms of, and you see that contributing to the reverse in revenue, that trend that was going down, in 2015, we see that going up, um, which is healthy for the business across the board. Thank you. Thank you for the very insightful talk. Um, I was going to ask about Deezer next. Yeah. Do you consider instrumental artists for that? We do. So, yeah, so the, the criteria for Deezer Next is um, the artist must not have, have had a top 20 album uh, in any market, um, and they must be releasing music in the year that we're going to add them to the Deezer Next program. And the other criteria is that we feel that they have the potential to have a very important year, and we always work. We, if we like the music, we then call in the manager and the artist to talk about what they have planned, 
you know, their aspirations, because one of the things that we see is the artists that have done very well um, have had great teams around them, because it's never one thing that breaks an artist, right? Like, it's, it's, it's a multitude of things that need to line up together. Um, so that, that's really essentially our criteria. We don't, it's not about genre, we don't have any genre restrictions, we don't have any language restrictions. It's really music, Obviously, you can't have a top 20 album, because if you have, you've kind of gone past that developing stage. Um, and be good to work with, or, or going to work with us. Um, I may have missed it at the very beginning, but um, what's the actual market share that streaming has at the moment? Of the overall yes. pie, over 60%. Um, to catch up with the trend, mm -hmm. do you analyze the way people is listening to music? Absolutely. A and so how do you do it? Yes. Okay. Um, that's a very good question because it's it's really fundamental to what we do. So, these are and and all all streaming companies are you know it's. It's both the technology and, it and, and the music side. And for us at Deezer, our approach with data is we have millions of users. We look at their behavior. So we know, for example, if you like to listen to music on your mobile or on your desktop. We know if you are a heavy listener in the morning, maybe when you're commuting. We know um, what genres you like what your favorite artists are. Um, and we kind of put that together to make sure that we recommend you content that you're going to be interested in. You might not have heard of it before, but generally you're probably going to think, yeah, that's good. Or best case scenario, wow, I love it. Never heard it before, love Rag and Bone Man, now I'm a fan. And our goal is always to increase listening length at Deezer. So we want to keep you listening to, to as many to as much music, podcasts, audiobooks that we can. So we analyze behavior, length, where you are, how you access the music. Do you listen to music via a playlist? Do you listen to music? Do you search for an album? Do you like, you know, so we, we analyze all the entry points. And we have a big data and research team that their job day in, day out is to do that. And one of the interesting things I always get asked, well, Albums are dead now because of the playlist. That's not true. Um, what we see in our data is that actually people access, still access albums, like 25% of how people access music on Deezer is via a search for an album. So that, that kind of shows you that it, it really isn't dead at all. There's lots of kind of dichotomies that I guess set up, like playlist versus albums, human creation versus algorithms, and, and it's never that black and white. Yeah, so I have a question, can you tell us something about this here in Spain or any Spanish artists? And also, is it like when you do promotion, is it only in the country or is it more international? Or? So how Deezer Next works, for, the, for Deezer Next, which is for the new and developing, we work with lots of artists across the board. So we work with you know, big superstar artists like Ed Sheeran, um, right through the middle, right through to new and developing. But for Deezer Next, there we choose four global priorities in the year, and they are worked in every single market. But what's important for us is, is localization and to give local artists and repertoire the stage that they need for promotion. So instead of only picking US and UK repertoire internationally and having Spain push that, it's important for us to make sure that we represent local repertoire as well. So for example, Deezer Spain will have the four global artists, but also be able to choose up to eight local artists that they also work with. And what we do is we, we watch that in that local market, and if that is trending or if that works well, we'll try it in a playlist in Germany. We might try it in a playlist in, in Brazil, and that's how we grow their fan bases in different markets. So there's a lot of cross-pollination. Um, for example, Deezer Spain had Rosalia on their Deezer Next um, list last year. Hi, 
you mentioned quite a lot of times for, or used the terminology work with an artist. Mm -hmm. Can you outline a little bit what work with an artist means in your business? Sure. So um, all artists now, and any artist who has a savvy team, and certainly all major labels and, and strong independents know that we're pretty much the first point of call when they're thinking about releasing music, they think about releasing music on streaming platforms. So it's not just about the CD. They will come to us very, very early and say, we have an album or an EP or, or this is the plan. We've got a tour. And try and pitch for playlist and also try and pitch for an artist marketing campaign. And for us, how we work together is we're constantly listening to music. We have an idea of what works for our audience, what we feel we want to prioritize, what we want to put in certain playlists. And some of the things that we've done um, with our Decent X artists, but also other bigger artists, is for example, we, so that includes playlisting, so that's editorial. We also do live events with artists. So for example, we take the experience outside of the platform. So an artist might perform and we invite their top fans. For example, we did it with Metallica. With Metallica, we called up, we can see who the biggest fans are of Metallica, right? So we, we call them up and we say, we're flying you to meet the band in Copenhagen next week. Um, and then that generates a lot of excitement. And it, it's also something that gives back to, to organically the people who have really followed this artist for a while. And also for Metallica also took over our metal channel and they programmed that channel for two weeks. Um, and that was a lot of, they took over the role of editor. So it really goes across the span of we create original content as well. So we create podcasts with artists. Um, we record artists. They do covers. So really creating original content to push people back and really create, boost their profile in Deezer for, for them and also making sure that they're getting bigger fan, fans in the, in the, in the product. Hi. Um, just a quick one. Is classical music and jazz music, are they following the same trend as everything else? That is also a very good question, and it segues into another topic which I want to touch on. So one of the things that, that people have been concerned about, or some of the criticisms across streaming, is that it's very hip-hop dominated. You know, you see, and pop, you see these big US kind of artists that kind of dominate streaming services. Um, and People absolutely do listen to jazz and classical, and what, I would, I, what we do see is that these listeners listen for longer, they're not as fickle. So we can see that they spend more time on the particular artist, they'll be listening for hours versus jumping around in playlists. So they're much more loyal, they listen deeper, um, and they're very focused on following each artist rather than going via a playlist. Although jazz and classical are very popular in moods and moments type playlists, which has opened up new avenues to get fans for jazz and classical artists, which they never had before. So people who might find, a lot of general consumers find jazz and classical quite intimidating. If you're not a music person, jazz and classical is a little bit intimidating. But what streaming has enabled is that, you know, you have mood playlists like Calm Piano and Meditation Piano, and, and that's really opened up discovery for a lot of people who might not even think they even like classical, but discover that actually they do. And one of the things that we're looking at as well is the way that uh, we pay royalties to artists. In general, the standard, and a lot of, not a lot of people know this, and it's a big topic, so I won't go down a rabbit hole, but the general accepted way of paying royalties in the streaming, in the streaming world, which has been agreed with right, rights holders, is a market share black box system. So we are making steps to change that to, to basically a, a much more transparent, fairer system, which is if I pay 10, 10 euros a month for my subscription service, and I listen 100% to Metallica, my 10 euros goes to Metallica. At the moment, it doesn't. It gets cut by market share. So if Drake has the biggest market share, it gets divvied up like that. So that's one of the things that we're moving towards. And by doing that, some of the early numbers that we're seeing is that there's a correction for genres like jazz and classical and rock, which really get a rise. Because you have people who are very, very loyal, intense listeners, but who might not be 
streaming 24-7 like someone who might be into hip-hop or EDM. I think we're going to have to wrap up there. I'm really sorry. Um, but thank you so much to uh, Selena thank for you. Uh, that amazing presentation. I think everyone got something out of that. And thank you to the audience for being so engaged. Thank, thank you. you so much, Selena.